This talk, like basically Rama and I met during the Cine Migranta Film Festival. She's done an experimental documentary about a hip hop group in Senegal and Gambia, which started to produce uh, very highly engaged political uh, lyrics and used those lyrics in order to affect political change. And the documentary follows this group, their support of a one party in particular, their disillusionment with that party, and then their ongoing commitment to political change and using music for that, and then using different channels to, gener like, to share the music. And it was super interesting for me because it was like something uh, it related very much to the work that I've done with Filippa Cesar and Sananhada on Luta Cacaba Inda, which is Creole for the struggle is not over yet. And that's basically rooted in guerrilla filmmaking movements of Guinea-Bissau of the 60s, which was something initiated by Emilcar Cabral, who many of you are probably not familiar with. He was one of the important uh, leaders of African independence movements, not only in Guinea-Bissau and Cape Verde, but he operated as an underground agent while employed by the Portuguese government as an agronomist, so going out and doing land surveys and research on farming across the different Portuguese colonies. So while he was employed for the, by the Portuguese state, which then had many um, colonies, he was actively working to organize resistance, which later, for example, in Guinea-Bissau turned into armed resistance, and the Declaration of Independence of Guinea-Bissau. Um, this was, this is, I'm, I'm giving you a little bit of information. One of the more interesting things about that movement is that when Fidel Castro offered military support, Amilcar Cabral basically said, no, what I need is to train my population to become teachers, doctors, and filmmakers. And if you're looking at something that happens in 1968, of course, it's before internet. But basically, his understanding was the need for a, a nation, a newly born independent state, to have education, health care, and a control of the media. And so these are the things which, like what you start to see uh, emerging is in a very uh, important militant f form of filmmaking, which was used to not only educate the public about other parts of the uh, country, but as well as to um, educate people about uh, like new farming techniques and give them access to I guess other forms of like other forms of narration so not following the Portuguese models in any case it ended up in very I important films so the the stuff that Rama works on today follows in those footsteps of people using the media that's closest to them we started talking about like militant filmmaking within the context of Cine Migranta, which is a like feminist run film festival dealing mostly with, with issues of migration. It's fairly global in its scope and it happens in Buenos Aires and Barcelona. So it's, yeah. The, um, I think the context was important last year because of the independence movement in Barcelona that during the festival we were there in exactly those days. So I can say that our inspired conversation had lots and lots of like um, inputs, starting points, and like points of departure. <clears throat> what we had sort of planned now was to carry on in a tradition of something which is from cyber feminism, fi blah, 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 cyber feminism to xenofeminism. I think. I hope most of you have some notion of cyber feminism, which is like breaking away from a concept from Donna Haraway of cyborg. She wrote the Cyborg Manifesto in 1983, which if you sort of imagine that 1983, the internet existed, but not as most people know it today, and not as most people knew it in 1993. So her notion was like, I think very revolutionary then. This was then uh, taken up by VNS Matrix, who wrote the Cyber Feminist Manifesto in, I think, 1991. Nora, is that 91? Again, before, like, yeah, an Australian group of, um, like, feminist protagonists that were mostly busy in online user environments, like MUDs and Moos. But they took, so that, even again, that internet was something very, very different. 
the reason I'm saying this is that each, each of these things is located within a specific time and space, and each of those politics gets played out in a very different um, media. So like the media that people are using is part of where they are and when they are. I think it's very easy for us, like it's, it's 2018, almost 2019, for a lot of, like not just millennials, for a lot of people that use media, how we use media today, we often forget what it was like 10 years ago or even like 20 years ago. And yet each of these medias definitely inform how we operate and how like even what we do with the media is defined by how the media informs us of what the media can be. I hope I'm not going too fast for the translators. So anyhow, <laughs> so this is something, it's, it's like I'm spiraling around. Anyhow, that's, I think that's, I hope that's enough of cyber feminism for you. I mean, and then there was a like, later movement in the 90s, European cyber feminism. I run a small mailing list called Faces, which is um, an online space for women doing art, gender, and technology. It's also 20 years old, that's, so it's, it's a long time. And uh, that way we hosted some of the early cyber feminist discussions. Again, it's something, you know, in the 90s, it was, it was, I think, a reasonable response to the kind of, uh, I would say, like eclectic and utopic moments of early Netz culture in Europe. I don't know, like, basically, it's something like CCC was happening, but it was in, in communication with things like Transmediala or Ars Electronica, and then all kinds of alternative types of internet culture were building up not only in Europe, but in Canada, something like, tele I know, I see some telecommunistans here. So, yeah, telecommunistas. Is that? <laughs> so, like, you, like these, uh, uh, that, uh, that cyber feminism of the 90s in Europe was really connected with like other things going on. But it was also, I think, fulfilling a kind of role for a need to have a feminist, a visibly feminist movement within this otherwise like very male dominant, like very white male dominated culture of IT stuff. Which I mean, it's very present here. I don't like. I don't think anybody would be shocked if I say that. So, and so, <laughs> or is anyone shocked? So, uh, yeah, I'm still hoping that Rama shows up. But. Um, yeah, so that's like there's cyber feminism. Xeno feminism has come up in the last couple of years. Mainly, it's an international group. Mostly, I think it's, it attempts to be an inter interdisciplinary group. I think they have changed themselves from collective to working group, and they try to combine things like programming with uh, literature, with theory, and then with a, a mathematics praxis. They're based in London, Australia, and Berlin, and somewhere in Canada, I forget. And like, I think, I think it's sort of, it's another point of departure. It borrows a lot from the cyber feminism or the cyborg ideas of Haraway, the VNS matrix uh, cyber feminist work, and then the other like OBN work of the cyber Fe feminist international. So it's, it builds on all of those things, expands it, borrows a lot from science fiction, and refers a lot to people like writers like Octavia Butler. So those, I kind of think it's an, it's an interesting alphabet. And it's a series of things that, like when Rama and I started talking, these were the things we were talking about. Is like, what would, for her as a filmmaker based in Dakar, what would those things sound like? And then of course in Dakar today, something like cyber feminism or xeno feminism sounds quite interesting. So ideally, we would have Annie Go from London, who does a lot with sound and cyber feminism, or Ala Mitrofanova, who's a feminist Russian philosopher, who's I think quite quite well known. She's extremely important in Russian, um, I think, intellectual and left circles. Like for example, she's a huge influence on Pussy Riot, and I do have to um, like always mention, even when when we had the when Ala and I had the a discussion about the chance of her coming here. She herself thought it would be more important for, sorry, my computer's actually with Rama, so that's, anyhow, I'm trying to remember the woman's name. Do you know the project Sci, uh, Sci Hub, Science Hub? So Sci Hub is a very important project that's programmed by a young, um, she's based in St. Petersburg, a programmer who is coming out of, I think, Kazakhstan? Does somebody know, can someone say that? Like, Anyhow, she's, she's basically created an online database 
of medical, if, any, if anybody knows more, please just feel free to correct me. I think it's like, this is my one sort of credit to, to um, Ala, is that she's really pushing this project, SciHub, because we were sort of looking at what, what would be science, uh, current and contemporary techno-feminist practices and the generation of this archive of medical research and basically taking journals that are usually very costly and only available in rich countries or available to people with access to uh, expensive private or academic medical journals. This woman has figured out a way to make this database available to lots of people for free. I think at last count she's been um, convicted in US courts for copyright violations and she would be immediately like imprisoned in the US and with like she has fines I think up to two million dollars. Like yeah it's a two million are you yeah Alexandra yeah Alexandra Al Bakian, yeah. So, anyhow, that's. I, I have to say, this is something I. I really have to honor, on, mention that as often as possible. If anybody has any way to help her or offer her two hundred million dollars, two million dollars, yeah, that would be fine. So, this is. I. This is the frame of where Rama and I are talking because it's. It's, going back and forth through lots of different like times and movements, like political movements, social movements, and it's always. It is always about access to education, access to healthcare and then access to media. And this is where we would start to talk about what for, and that would go into a revolution. And then it gets important because not every, like we were talking last night just casually, that I know a lot of people here do very important like um, technology-based work for change, but as I think we all know, hacking has also got this um, hobby aspect to it. So for a lot of people, it's, it's a fun free time activity. And there is something where I think one, I would love to be able to live in a world where in my free time I could just you know, fool around and it didn't matter. Like I would love to live in a world where there was no need for doing anything important. And for, like I would prefer to just get drunk and dance all the time. But the, like, it's, it's really, we don't live in times where that, I do get drunk and dance a lot every chance I get, don't get me wrong. But um, we do, like, there are things that are going on in the world actually demand a kind of action. And it, because especially now, it's so much uh, revolving around media. And it's like really basic things, it's not just about how you accumulate wealth, it's what kinds of things you can do with that wealth. And for most people on the planet, it's really access to very like basic things, and that's like education and healthcare follow, and the media is really important. And one thing is we were looking at how then is something like, for example, internet super important across like, um, Okay, of course we know that in Germany, living in Germany, but in different poor countries, the like internets and media play different roles. And for example, we were talking about uh, how microfinancing and micropayments via um, mobile phones was something developed by a, a Senegalese programmer. Rama would tell me us the name and the longer story about this if she were here. Is she uh, okay? Anyhow but something like that that was developed in Kenya, and not because it was an app that someone could sell or hang out and talk about in any of the annoying cafes in Berlin, but because it was something that would be useful for people to use, and like it's, it's become a very highly used um, payment system in Senegal and in Gambia. And that's something which is like, those are like little innovations and those are the models that sort of start to translate out into other things. So we tend to often think of Africa as being in need of technologies, but we don't often like, and I, in this case I'm gonna say we as people in wealthy countries or in the West, don't tend to look at what types of developments are happening there that then infiltrate and infect what we are doing and how we use technology. And if my, my sort of favorite example is the payment for um, text messages on mobile phones, I think, Lots of people forget that was a free, um, it was a free forgotten feature of mobile telephones when they first became popular. And that it was because of the high use of text messaging in, in different African countries, I think primarily in Nigeria, where telephone, uh, mobile telephone operators, what are they, there must be a better word for that, started to look at why they were selling so many mobile phones and had contracts and no one like, was using that very, at that time, high cost telephony networks. And when they looked into it, they realized there was a lot of data being exchanged, but it was all going over text messaging. So that's when text messaging became a service that you paid for and not just a kind of built-in, like side, like forgotten feature. 
I don't know if you remember when text messaging was free. I do. So that's something. But that was that, like, the reason we all pay for text messaging now is because it was so widely used and embraced across Africa. So you can blame Africa for paying for your text messages. And these are things where it's like, how do. I mean, it's, it's, that might seem like it's a very stupid and small trivial thing, but it points to how um, like the existing like, technologies that we use can be exploited. And they, basically, those, uh, those exploits, which are, could be called hacks, are also based on what people need and like, their own realities. And those realities vary. And, like, no matter like, what kind of time we share, there are also the other conditions that we don't share. And then it's interesting to see how, we, how things that come up in different contexts can be shared across those like different geospecific political social conditions. So I'm trying to stick to my script that Rama and I had in spite of her not being here with me. Ah, I, I hope that um, Nora or somebody can tell me when her film will be screened tomorrow. That's the revolution will not be televised, will be screened tomorrow at sometime in this um, big hall just over here to the it's over there, I guess. So, you know, we, we were looking at, okay, what, what, what are the medias? And then, like, what could revolution be? Why would we do that? And then why would different media matter in that? And one of the things is um, looking at film. I had a talk with an old buddy from Amsterdam last night. And we were talking, like, he doesn't watch movies. For him, it's a waste of time and entertainment. And we talked about how different types of narratives can open up a mind space and how those can be useful operators. And it's not just that they rely on technology to be built. I mean, this is something where if you look at how people, I mean, there's a lot of, like, a whole sort of new line of work in the area of something called digital storytelling. I'm not particularly keen on this particular term, but it's something where looking at how people can use uh, new technologies to tell stories, right? But what kind of stories do you tell and what do they do? And so, for example, a film can do many things. And if, of course, a film like Rama's film or like the, when I, when I met her, I was, I was screening Spell Reel, which is based on the, the militant media of Guinea-Bissau. It's a project by Philippa Cesar and Sanana and Hada. And those are things that get shown often in museums, um, in very like film festivals, in very sort of high and f like arty farty locations. But they also get shown in activist situations like Cine Migranta, or in different uh, public viewing scenarios, in any number of places across like across Guinea-Bissau, across Gambia and Senegal. So those are places these films can be shown in all of those places and they will resonate very differently with all of those publics. And in order, like creating a film that can tell, that can be coherent across all of those spaces is not a small feat, but it's like something that those, it can activate different sets of knowledge. And I mean this, I think it's fairly basic, but it's not, it's not unimportant to think about what it means for somebody to enter into the museum space. I think somebody like Rama, who's one of the um, very small number of African women producers and like film producers who is very comfortable working with activists, feminists across, you know, where, like South Africa, Senegal, Gambia, and also being very active and being able to inhabit the space of like the Museum of Modern Art in New York and have her work be shown there. This is something where it's, it's a kind of social hacking. Once she has the credibility of being in a place like MoMA, it gives her a credibility to raise money to, in order to do further work that can then later be shown in other completely different spaces. I think it's the same with Philippa Cesar and with Sana and Hada, even my work, that the credibility that you get due to some kind of institutional support or affiliation can be then uh, transferred into some kind of social power that can be utilized elsewhere. And I think those are things that well, it's it's very basic, but I think people don't. If you have a sort of set, if you have your own kind of power, ability to move, ability to speak, ability to do things, you often don't think like not many people often don't think about what that like how that's generated or how that can be used. So in a way, how that is a privilege and how it could be used to ex like open up privileges for other people. So, and this is like in the end, like this is. 
How much time? Wait, just a second. Yeah. Hmm. I'm fine. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's, yeah that's, I'm just taking a quick, a quick break. I wish I had a song for you. The Revolution Will Not Be Televised will be screened tomorrow in the Art and Play area at 20 minutes past midnight. So you can come and have, have a look at the screening of, of the film tomorrow night at 20 past 12 in the Art and Play area. We still have half an hour uh, of this presentation and there are two microphones in the room, that microphone number one and microphone number two. So when we have a Q&A, then you can stand up behind the microphones and we can uh, um, give you the word and, and uh, have a dialogue with Diana. And there will also be the opportunity of having questions from the internet. Thanks. <laughs> if anybody would like to come up and sing a small song, that would be very welcome. No, this is, yeah, sorry, I'm trying to, I'm doing my best to sort of stretch out our conversation. The other thing that, like, f because this, like, f something like CCC, what, like, Ram and I were talking, like, we've been, t we've been having a very long, ongoing discussion, and our idea was just to share that with you. So, anyhow, I, I'm hoping that she's not totally lost and or in trouble somewhere in Leipzig. So, it's, uh, I believe her charger may have uh, failed. I believe her phone may uh, be not working. But, uh, in any case, the, the question of something like hacking that we were talking about what, like when we, when we first met, we were talking about what it means to hack and what it means to basically enter spaces where you're not allowed to be. And like what it means to then inhabit that space, what it means to use that ability to be in that space in order to be then more powerful in other spaces. And I, I hope that's kind of clear. I think it's, it's like, I think everybody gets that, but it's like, I, I don't, I think it's easy to take it for granted and it's easy to take it for, it's easy to not recognize that not everybody has that ability to be like, not just mobile in terms of geography, but in terms of social spaces and how you're like, what it means to have uh, a voice and what it means to have people listen to your voice. So it's one thing to be able to speak up. It's another thing to have people, to have an impact on what, uh, for people to listen to you. And, and that can be on a political level, social level, whatever. So, and those are things it's like, I, it's very basic, but it's like, Hacking systems is one one of the things you do is open up doors to make yourself like to make people heard, and this is very much in line with what CCC is has been about. I think from the very beginning is creating like meaningful forms of communication, often exploiting technology for that. But I don't think it's ever been only about the technology. Like this is something it's it's very important that it's not it's always been rooted in something else, which has much more to do with how we live in a society. And so here we go with like that's where. Ram and I kind of agree because we've had lots of, I think, very productive disagreements on what hacking is or what hacking could be. And it is like one of the things is like people playing around. And this, this is going to happen anywhere. And nothing against people that do make sort of entertainment based film, music, etc. That's not, that's, that's not a complaint on that, but it's something that for those people that are working actively to create, like, I think, or to activate social change, not just as activists, but using different means to create awareness to not, not just educate people, but to get people, I think, to act in unison with their consciousness. It's, it's a, a word that I find very difficult to say, conscialization. And um, I would ask Francisca, but I think she's, she's writing a blog. No, this is, uh, conscialization is like, how do you get people in touch with their own, like not their lived politics and get people to realize how their daily life is also politicized. And that's something where you understand that the basics, like your basic social position, the social infrastructures, the economic structures are part of a larger political system. And once you understand how you operate within that, you can then act more effectively politically, like once you understand the politics of every, like how spaces relate, I mean going to school, taking the bus, going to work, all of those things, what are the politics that inform those things? Then you can start to, for example, like organize a union, organize a political movement, but you can only do that when you really understand like what are your 
basic conditions and how those can be a springboard for li bigger movements. And this is, I think these are things that are very like general but in common across around places around the world. So nevertheless, we live in a kind of info bubble time when people have more access to information, they have more like means, media and so on, but nevertheless we like people could easily get informed, but facts mean less than ever. So this is like this is sort of a I guess ironic that in the moment when people could potentially be better informed, when more people could be better informed than ever because of having access to useful and meaningful information is exactly the moment when the notion of the fact dies, right? And it's of course conveniently parallels the rise of really hardcore right-wing movements all over. So Argentina, Turkey, you know, I don't need to list them, right? That's, we all know, that's Germany. Yeah, so. So this is something where, like, how do you get people to understand, like, to, and this is like, it's like activating different knowledge sets. So, yeah. And then, that's like, so I would continue with Rama discussing what is hacking? What is it good for? And what would it mean, like, what would, what would it mean, like, oh, how many of you guys would like, like go to Senegal and then like, how would you share stuff there? Because then it, she's like, yeah, all the computer freaks there would, okay, love to come here, and of course that would be, uh, yeah, I think it would be funny and weird and useful, probably, probably not without tensions, so. Uh. I am going to, I think, oh, is that Rama? So. I kind of, like, I know it's early, but I think I'm. I, I think that's what I have to say about this. And I, like, maybe if you have questions, comments, if you have more factoids to add, I would be happy to allow you to share the stage. Complaints. Mm. So, as I mentioned before, we have two microphones. We have microphone one and two. So, if we have questions, comments, um, please join in the conversation. So go, go to the microphone that's in the middle of the room or on the side of the room. And then it's microphone number two in a couple of seconds. There you go. Okay. Microphone number two. Thank you. Let's still go on a discussion. This is like a proper uh, big question. But maybe two things that interest me. You mentioned the lack of uh, or the maybe dominant people here, how can we change this? Do you, can you share strategies? How do we change the white male uh, age uh, audience in this kind of event? And second part, I'm interested about the thematic about decolonizing technology. And I don't know, maybe you can pick any part of it that would fit to the conversation. Thank you. Wow, what the, that's great. I, first of all, I think we are like Nora Badri and the CCC team, I think for many years, has worked to try to make a more inclusive space. And I really applaud them for that. I have to really thank Nora, especially here. So thank you, Nora, for really working on this and taking up this opportunity and also hacking this space for that. Because I think this is one of the first things is recognizing um, at what time, what like, for any kind of grouping or social formation, when it's homogenous, it tends to reflect the interests of those groups. And I, I, I've known really wonderful people from CCC for many years, but like, I think in 19, like 2001, like I know that, when, when did they do the Hexen thing? When did this Hexen thing start? Like 2001, 2002? And this was like, I was in the room when a bunch of guys decided to do that and I sort of applauded the interest in having a space for women. But at that point I was like, I'm not interested in being at that table because I want to sit at the grown up table, which is basically where the, like basically I was gonna stay at the table where the boys were. And as like, I do feminist stuff, but when I want my own room, I'll ask for it, you know, and sit loudly and so on. So this is one thing is like figuring out things. and. And giving people, like people will make mistakes. That's something, like when you talk about inclusive practices, 
one thing is we were having chats last night about like what would it mean for my colleagues from We Are Born Free Empowerment Radio in Berlin, for example, who do work coming out of Iranian Platz, which is a refugee movement, which was like the group that started to break out of the um, the forced camps in in Germany, and went and occupied Iranian Platz. For example, a lot of the guys there speak Wolof. A lot of the like different people that are active in that movement are coming out of Gambia and Senegal. Coming to this event, like for even for Rama as a, like one African woman, it's, it's like I we were sort of counting last night. It's, an, it's not a whole lot of black people here. Let's let's be honest. And to be able to occupy a space like this, may, and maybe she got a little bit. Of, I have to. I'm not. I don't want to speak for. Maybe she got a little bit of stage fright today. So this is something like actually we had lovely engaged conversations with many people and already some interesting unpleasant experiences. So, this, which is going to happen, and she knew that. Like this is something when she she's been. Uh, she operates in enough different situations to know that coming to a space like this, there might be an, an unpleasant encounter. And so that's something which, you know, that's, that's, that's a part of needing to invite, needing to have people that are going to be able to inhabit this kind of space, have enough thick skin to be able to deal with, like let's say, a, a different range of encounters and being able to still have a voice there. So that's one thing. Once you start to include like different, uh, let, let's say, people working from different angles, because it, and it's, it's not just about, like, it's not about ethnic differences or racial differences, it's about different types of ways of engagement, but once you start to mix up who is doing the um, talking and who is getting represented, that already is going to be a driving force for a different kind of public, and that's going to inform then who comes in the next, like, the next generations. And this is, uh, I, I, I would have like I would have shown you clips of We Are Born uh, We Are Born Born in Flames, Lizzie Borden's film. I have a really crappy copy. If you're around later, I can give you a copy. She's given me permission to do this. The director, so it's a film from '83, which basically shows a lot of how people um, work and do social outreach. I am going to say like I will use Reboot FM in Berlin. It's an artist-run radio. We say free artist radio. I'm very proud because when we started in um, 2003, it's going to be like 15 years old as an actual running radio in, in Berlin next year, in like in three, two weeks, I think. Um, in any case, what we started doing was asking a bunch of different people, and because like in that time I did a little bit of work with groups like Kanak Attack, which was a, a group of different people in Germany doing deconstruction of identity politics. And so asking like different Afro-German groups, DJ collectives, um, art groups, activist groups, asking them what would they like out of a radio like, in order to do radio and in order to listen to it. This was the first thing, asking a whole bunch of different people. And this is working along the lines of like basically feminist organi organizing. But also, like we developed a whole software. Seda Gursus is a feminist technologist. We used a lot of the same models that they actually did. It in, it impacted how a software got developed, just by asking people lots of questions and then building that into a structure. So that's something we're doing outreach, but then having a lot of different interests represented in the the thing and on different levels. And that means like who has a say, who's rep like who gets represented and who is spoken to. Because those are these are things where it's like once you start mixing that up, things get oh oh good, thank you. That's what we also do in the radio. I like the silent fifteen. So anyhow, that's I it's I think there are a lot of different ways to do that. Until today, Reboot has a really very good mixed thing, and we we are going mixed across. Like for us, diversity is not a term we use. In the, to the extent we use it, it means East West German. It means old young people. It means men women. It means um, DJs, musicians, actors, artists, whatever. So that's like for us, it's like we we use that term then to uh, we we use that term to sort of understand everything and not because often like something like diversity or inclusion assumes basically a dominant culture perspective, like and that already is going to inform how people um, what is understood in terms of whose need is fulfilled, right? Like, so one thing is, do you want to have people meaningfully engaging with those, like, working across differences, social, political, economic, etc., gender, 
do you want to have meaningful engagement or do you want to have decoration? Because often diversity is used to um, supply decoration and that means minority people, whatever, like are then there to be counted and be representative of some kind of difference, but not actually to ha have a meaningful role or a meaningful stake in anything. And I think that's, those are like, yeah, those are processes and I, I'm, I'm doing this sort of thing for a long time and I really think it's, it's work, it takes a lot of time and energy. I think the results are better. So that's, you know, I think that, that would be my long, and I, although I'm very enthusiastic about that question because it's, it's something, I think the results get better. And once we start, like, once we stop looking at what makes us different and start looking at what we have in common, that's, I think then you have a really potential to do more things. And there's, there's like, there are lots of things that we can work with, so. Yeah. I loved your term, by the way. I can, can, please give me your name later of decolonizing technology. I think that's a wonderful, um, I didn't say that, you did, so thank you for that. Didn't, uh, this is something I think, you know, hmm. I can only say thank you. I think we should. It's like decolonizing technology on all areas because it's, for me, the technologies that we use, media, it's, it's really happening, like looking at how media, like something like Facebook, comes out of its time, it was always built to um, not, just, not just become a money earner, it was always meant to capitalize on things. It was, it's built from the ground up, not just to gain your um, access to your information, it's, it's meant to use your, like to in, uh, activate you or the public to functionalize its own, your own personal relationships, basically to monetize your social, your friends, family, etc., into contacts, and understand that as an accum accumulation of wealth. So that's that. I'm sure that's also reflected in the code. But that's that's why it's there. It's meant it's meant to encourage people to, uh, yeah, find like uh, monetize or oh, no, I had a better term. I'm sorry. Anyhow, it's it's it capitalize on your own like social connections it, you know, with, with people. It's, I think it's, it's kind of sick, and I'm sure that's also reflected in the code. So one thing is understanding like, what's, what's on the layers that you don't see that you use, and I think that's very important for programming, who uses it and what they use it for, and then what gets communicated. And all of those things are very important in terms of understanding like, what's, what's media. So that's, but thanks, I, I'm really happy. Can you say your name? No, just say it, can you just shout? She said later? Yeah, your name's not just... What? Orale, orale, okay, so thank you. So there, yeah, you get, this is, I'm sure there are thousands of people listening on the internet right now, so that's, yeah. And we have uh, another question on microphone number two. Uh, thanks, that will be a bit of a chunk, but you mentioned xenofeminism earlier, and also in your title. And I've tried, to wrap my head around this, especially the Xenofeminist Manifesto, which is a quite decisive criticism of many established feminist practices, especially those turning towards representation of different groups and so on and so forth, and rather focuses on the body, biohacking, and all that stuff. So I would be really curious to hear what you as a filmmaker and radio person, if I got that right, what you take out of that movement or how that inspires your work. Thank you, okay. I am a radio, like, whatever, editor. I, I only work with filmmakers, so I'm a okay. cosmic advisor. It doesn't inspire my work at all. Mm -hmm. So I think, like, it's, my work has inspired that stuff, and I'm, I'm, I don't want to be, like, I'm not being, like, even arrogant here. It's absolutely clear, like, the xeno-feminists are drawing on lots of things, like, the kind of stuff I've been doing with the internet for 20 years, and many other things. So that's, like, to be clear, like, many, many other things. So my, in, like, I have had lots of heated debates. For example, Annie Go, um, like, Zeno is, uh, it's a mathematical term, but nevertheless, it, ha it resonates, it has, like, for many people, when they hear Zeno, they hear xenophobia. And for example, only a group of white women wouldn't hear that, you know, like, like could sit around and say, we're gonna call something xenofeminism and not hear xenophobia. And this is like, I have to say that, yeah, of course, this is, this is one of the criticisms that comes out of black feminists that are interested in like te techno-feminism or something like that. So, you know, I, I think that they 
have drawn a lot of things together. The, the Xeno Feminist Manifesto is what is it? It's can, can you go? Can you go? What is the name of it? The actual name is like. Uh, uh, hmm. But what are you asking? The the name the Xeno Feminist Manifesto has it's like how. A politics for. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. This is yeah. And I think it's a, I think it's a, I think it's a useful read. I think it's inspiring and interesting, and I think it can, because one of the things it's 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 denial of, basically it's a, it's it has a certain denial of identity politics in it, in ter, like which I find a very difficult term. It has a denial in it of a fixed notion of identity, and that is a deconstruction of identity politics. Nevertheless, it it's, it has man, many problems in it. So this is something, but this alienation, understanding alienation as a positive space to work from. So I think it's something that it's useful to read and it's useful to think about. But as a manifesto, I don't think it's it's not offering anything like specific to do, but it's offering specific things to think about that should be hopefully a springboard to understanding like how, um, yeah, something like gender, how gender, race, and class play, get played in and out of, like play in and out of and off of technology. So that's, I, I, but I, I, I also just think it's a, it's a kind of cool word. Like it's, I think it's, by the way, this is blatantly, we use it, we use it for, we've done a whole series of talks and we use it because it's a way of locating something like a 25, 30 year uh, techno feminist idea range. And it's this, if you go cyber feminism to xeno feminism, it's, it's a, we, like, when I say we face as different colleagues, we've done an anecdoted, anecdoted alphabet of, like, feminist alphabet of um, media, stuff like that. So it's playing with how you work with linearity and techno, like, linearity. So that's, it's, a, it's also a cheap way to uh, advertise something. Do we have any more questions? We still have about eight, seven minutes before we need to wrap up. Are there any questions from the internet? Signal angels? No. Nope. Well, I think it's been very inspiring and great. There is one. Yay! Come up to the microphone. Microphone number two. Hi. I just want to thank you for a really amazing uh, inspiration, especially having come from Hambacher Forest, where we experienced third largest uh, police action in the history of Germany and the. Uh, largest in the history of North Rhine Westphalia. And after being evicted from 11 forest occupation, 63 houses, we experienced an incredible flow of uh, outpouring of support, a 50,000 demo and uh, reoccupation of the forest. And regardless, the narrative of cases like this is so min minimal in the mainstream media, that's what really recharged us was the phenomenal amount of uh, activists uh, uh, documentarians and filmmakers who have come to the forest, who've explored the narrative, especially from the anarcho-feminist uh, perspective, which is uh, one of our foundation of our struggle. And I wanted to ask you, how could we actually reach out to more people from the artist community, from the polit uh, uh, political uh, documentarian community, and bring them and invite them to the struggle? And speaking of which, I would also like to invite you as well to come and visit us in the forest as well. Thank you. Yeah, bravo, yeah, okay, sure, I'm there, like, yeah, uh, actually, like, a group of us would like to visit you anyway, so, that's, uh, yeah, we are, like, I mean, time, like, like, time is time, you know, it's, like, where do you, where are you able to focus on things, but, actually, there, there's, what I think is interesting about those things is, like, figuring out, like, f building up, I, I hate the term networking, but I think it's very important to build up coalitions and alliances and look for people with shared interests, and out of that, you know, you, like ha it's it's very much it's like there is no sort of local regional issue that doesn't have a kind of mirror somewhere else and it is very important to build up alliances and share information and out of that gain strength but yeah that's and i don't know use the internet i i you know it's great send people emails and ask them to do that open calls that's that's what i would suggest and of course why not uh find your local smallest radio and broadcast so is there anybody hiding in their seats with a burning question? Please get up to the microphones so that everybody can hear your questions. Okay, I'm, I'm going to say just like, since, since I'm just here now and like I believe, I hope, I really hope Rama is fine. Like that's something. Um, I do run a, a small mailing list for women in media and this is one of the things that uh, 
click. Please do, if you're interested, it's called faces-l.net. That used to stand for like list, so it's still, so that's why the URL is like that. You shoot us an email. We do, we do check who you are. So like, like it's, it's for women. Uh, it's always been, uh, since day one, it's been open to trans women, but basically women who identify, like people who identify as women and live that. It's been up for uh, discussion several times over the tr last 20 years. It's not a, it's not a, um, how can I say, it's not a huge list, it's like maybe 400 people. There's another 400 in the larger community, but it's a place where people can share information about their work. And this is, for example, like one of the things we do is to, just to build up a, a, a place where we can find each other. Like there will be a little faces gathering, I think tomorrow around lunchtime. I guess that's at five o'clock here, right? So somewhere around. So if, you, if you're interested in getting in contact with more women and finding out about what women are doing with art, gender, and technology, faces is a good place. But of course, I, I also want to say it was never ever formed or founded with the notion that we would stay there. So it's a place where we, we can share information, exchange amongst the women, the ladies, the girls, whatevers. But it's never um, uh, with the idea that that's where we would stay. So it's, it's one of the things that you do in order to have that place and then go out and be, you know, whatever, stronger, louder, angrier, funnier in the world. So anybody interested in that, please join in. We have a question for microphone number two. Hello. Hello. Uh, I'm one of the translators of the Sinofeminist Manifesto into Spanish, and I actually work with Luca Fraser, who's one of the members of the collective. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, in your perspective, um, what kind of technologies do you see, or strategies do you see forming that advance a Sinofeminist uh, program or strategy? Any kind of te new technologies we should be looking out forward to? No, I actually like. I actually think that the. I mean, that would be that the t the best technology that the Zeno Feminist Manifesto inspires people to use, is the one in your brain. Like that's that's actually what I think. It's a. I think it's very effective for getting people to think a little bit differently about things, and let's. I think in spite of the interdisciplinarity of the group, they're not. High, they're not really into technology. You know, they're not, they're not programmers on that, like they're not deeply embedded in any kind of technological movement. I don't think it matters. I think the ideas that are, the questions that it raises could be practiced in different ways in how we work with technology. And I think that, that would be the interesting thing to do. Uh, I guess it's at that point, but actually one of the members does work in artificial intelligence and uh, return-oriented programming. So I do think that they're, they're embedded in technology. So, yeah. Yeah, but I, I mean, the, nothing. I don't want to argue with you about this, but the group itself is not like they, they're really not. They're not, like the group itself doesn't. There is no techno. There is no xeno feminist techno technological practice, and that's that's what I mean. So uh, there is. <laughs> it's a computer scientist in Halifax. Yeah, but uh, the, the, then you you maybe you want to name a, a practice that would be a xeno feminist practice. Uh, Sure, genome editing, CRISPR, um, Elizabeth Preciado, maybe edit, self-editing in terms of uh, body mechanics. But that's okay. If you if you call if you want to call those xenofeminist practices, that's Labor fine. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. So. Okay. Cool. That's. <laughs> I wouldn't sue you for it either. Good, I think we have about one minute left, so let's give Diana McCarthy a big round of applause for incredible presentation and talk.